Okay, welcome everybody to our uh, weekly seminar series. This week, we are very honored to host uh, Dr. Stephanie cabot Paul from the University of um, Potsdam in Germany. Uh, Stephanie is a postdoctoral uh, associate fellow at the University of Potsdam. She is a paleoclimatologist and paleoceanographer with special interest in the interplay between low and high latitude climate processes, as well as marine and terrestrial teleconnections. She received her diploma, diploma, which is a master equivalent in Israel, in geoecology at the uh, technical, <clears throat> well, in Germany, Technische Universität Berg, Demir Freiberg, I hope that I say it right, it's in fine. Germany, in 2012, and a PhD in paleoclimatology in 2016 from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Throughout her international PhD postdoctoral research projects in Canada, Taiwan, and in Germany, Stephanie has gathered a strong and well-publicized background in paleoceanography and paleoclimatology. Specifically, her research has focused on monsoonal variability, low and high latitude teleconnections, marine terrestrial interface interferences, and the plioplasticine climate history on millennial to orbital timescales. For this, she combines methods from sedimentology, stratigraphy, micropaleontology, and geochemistry. Her current research focuses on the interface between climate change and human evolution. She is a proponent of the ICDP Hominin Site and Pilot Lakes Drilling Project, the HSPDP, and specifically works on the Chuba Hill Drilling Project as well. So with this word, Stephanie, the podium is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I really like to thank you for inviting me by giving me this opportunity to talk about my work. And today's presentation will present a paper more or less that was published in summer this year in PNS and deals with how climate change might have been interconnected to human evolution. The first part of the talk will kind of like try to outline the issues with this approach, what is known about human evolution, what is known about the climate framework that is supposedly connected to that. Then I'll tell you what is in the study and what we found out. And that will then lead me over into the take home messages and a kind of bit of a uh, perspective on what's to come or what should be done in the future. So just to jump right into the topic. So did my slide change? Did this work? Okay, perfect. Yes, so, indeed, indeed. Thank you. So this is a schematic that I feel comes from a paper that was just published a couple of weeks ago from Tyler Faith. And I think it sums up the entire problematic fairly nicely. So on the right side of the figure, you kind of have global uh, representation of global climate records and then regional environmental records on one hand, which is like the climate part. And on the other hand, you have the archeological record. So that consists of what actually happened and that we don't know, and the observed human evolutionary history that we derive from, from fossils that we can find, which is usually just a small proportion of what really happened. So in the past, and I'll get to, in, to that in a, in a few seconds, is that these, try, these things have to be kind of like being lined up because the idea is climate change changed the environment for early humans, so they had to change in some way too. And the idea is that you have certain events in the global climate record, just as much in the environmental record, that then translate into humans on the scale, either regional or over-regional. But there are a lot of issues with this, not just a matter of whether or not climate change actually influenced humans, but also with the human record, as well as a climate record. So I'm gonna go through these two points now, one by one to outline what's the issue before I then jump into how our study try to advance on this issue to help the entire problem along a little bit. So the first thing that you kind of like need to understand is what does a fossil record actually represent? And I really like to say I'm not, not an archeologist, so I'm not a super expert on this, but I really like this representation from Tyler because to even to me as a non-archaeology person, it really drives home the issues with the archaeological record. 
So on the left side with the A panel, you have four slides of Africa that move along a time scale, which is Y. So when you have random species moving from Southern Africa, slowly but surely towards Northern Africa. So this is what translates in panel B to these orange columns. So that human species slowly but surely moved from south to north and existed in between for certain amounts of time, also in the east and in the central African continent. And then you have in green next to that what in an idealist way the fossil record actually represents because we only have a skull here and a skull there. So it only gives us a small proportion of what actually happened. So you cannot base on a fossil here or a fossil there really infer how people moved and when they moved and how certain species occur or didn't occur. It's not necessarily representative because first off, there's a bias of where we go and look for skulls. For instance, East and South Africa are heavily investigated because we know fossils are there. So you go there because you figure there have been skulls there before. So maybe you find another one. Um, but it's not like people go to the middle of the Sahara and start looking there because not too much found there. So maybe there's nothing. This gives a bias to, these, to the archaeological record and so has a huge bias if you want to link these stuff to climate change. Um, this is basically one issue and to just kind of like highlight this even more. This is just some of the most famous skulls found in Africa. Uh, roughly which species they are prolonged to and the time, the way they have been dated. So if you just concentrate on the orange dots on this, you have the oldest at the moment, the oldest skull related to Homo sapiens in Morocco, which is about 300,000 years old, and the stuff in East Africa, which is much younger. So you can, could be tempted to say, okay, we started off in the West and then we kind of like spread to the East, but we don't know that. That is basically what the figure before tried to show you. We don't have the entire story. We have these bunch of skulls that tell you more or less we were everywhere. And that's about it. So this is the first problem in the equation of how did climate change translate to human evolution, which gets us now to the second part of this equation, human, the, the climate part. So climate change, the way we understand that, that it might have had an impact on humans, boils down to three hypotheses. One, stable habitat, meaning whether or not it's wet or dry, it's a completely new can of worms, but it had to be stable for our species to do something. So whether or not it's to advance or to move, the habitat had to be stable. Then there's a second hypothesis, which is a progressive habitat change, meaning you change the habitat, for instance, from wet to dry or from dry to wet. And this long-term progressive change is what drove innovation. It was drove species diversification. It's what drove dispersion of our ancestors. And then you have the last theory, which is more variable habitat. So very strong, high frequency changes from wet to dry is what drove whatever was going on in the human evolutionary tree. These are the main hypotheses that are out there. And the idea that this has something to do with human evolution is actually not that old in terms of paleoclimatology. In 1995, one of the first papers that tried to make this link on a large scale was from Peter Domenico. This is a very old figure, so I'm sorry that the resolution is not very good. But this basically boils down what you just saw three slides before in that schematic that I showed you. What the authors did is basically on the right, they put the global signal. This is delta 18 O, so stable oxygen isotope, which change in their percentage or in their per mil concentration from warm to cold periods, um, being lighter when it's warm and more heavy when it's cold. So you can see the glacial interglacial nomenclature on the scale. Um, then you see soil that are certain C. This is stuff that was measured from Africa and is supposed to indicate a shift from woodland to grassland. So from more moisture conditions to more drier conditions in this case. Then the human evolutionary tree at the time, this has changed, of course, but at the time, this is 
what was known. And then the inference of this onto the African climate variability scale. What they basically said is, or what this translates to is, global climate change driven by ice volume changes across the Pleiopleistocene translated into African climate change and by default into environmental change in Africa and thus human evolution. The, one of the main arguments that paper made was at the time of about 3 million years, you see this first dotted um, bar thingy down at the figure. They made the argument that this, the intensification of Northern hemisphere glaciation at the time, so the increase of ice volume in the Northern hemisphere, that this point marked a distinct change in human evolution, distinct change in the way African climate worked and a distinct change in the way African vegetation, for instance, worked, like how it, what it consisted of. This theory that you need really, really big ice sheets to have a distinct change in climate in the tropics that then translate into human evolution from the mid nineties persisted basically up to today. This is a really nice figure that tries to summarize the rise and fall of this hypothesis. So what you can see here are from the 1980s to 2020. You see um, at, the, at the top, you see publications. And then you see papers that are for the argument that Northern Hemisphere glaciation had a huge impact on climate change in Africa and human evolution. And then the papers that say otherwise. So everything started off in the 90, 1984 when Nick Shackleton basically kind of defined the onset of Northern Hemisphere glaciation around, at that time, around 2.5 million years. It has shifted a little bit. Then there was a workshop in the early 90s where people were like trying to think together how this might translate to African climate change into human evolution. This led to the publication, amongst other that I just showed you, defining this, making opening this mechanism that long-term change in global ice volume led to drought in Africa, and that kind of like sparked human evolution in whatever shape or form. And this theory got accepted because more and more paper came out supporting it until it was widely accepted basically by the 2000s, got into textbooks and everything. And then with the start of the 2000s, the idea came in that might not actually be right. And then more and more paper came out, making an argument against this, despite the fact, as you can see from the green, the pro papers, this idea still persists. There are still a lot of papers out there where you can just nature science published in the last couple of years, where you can see glacial interglacial change, most dominant climatic driver in the tropics, specifically Africa. So if it's not, which is basically the argument our paper is trying to make, if it's not glacial interglacial change, then you do need a mechanism that drives climate variability in Africa. So if it's not ice sheets, what else is it? This is what particularly the contra papers are getting more and more into over the years. And that is what else could it be? This is a very um, known figure that compared dust records. So marine records um, around Africa, uh, one is from the Arabian Sea, one is offshore the Sahara, uh, or more or less a little bit more further Morocco, and the, the lower bottom one is the one offshore Sahara. So this is across the last five million years. These are dust records, so the dust accumulation in the ocean was reconstructed coming from the African continent into the marine realm. And what they found when they analyzed this, which is the red dotted line, was a breakpoint analysis, meaning they looked at the linear trend and then checked when the linear trend changed, defining this change as a breaking point. And what they found is that the long-term change in these records over the last five million years is not at the time when you have this intensification of Northern Hemisphere glaciation. You have it around a million and a half, two million years, give it a take. So it's about a million years later than what previously was proposed. And this is all you can find. So the argument was made, it's not glacial interglacial change, maybe walker circulation. So, which kind of gets us to 
what is worker circulation and why has it been brought into the discussion as a contra argument to glacier interglacial change? Worker circulation is actually something really fun. Worker circulation is a band of convection cells along the equator. Like it's completely different to, let's say, a Hadley cell, which goes from the tropics to the subtropics. This, this entire atmospheric system operates along the equator. Usually, um, most people have heard of changes in the walker circulation in terms of El Nino and La Nina. These are two modes, if you want, of the walker circulation that are fairly well known because they have a huge impact on Earth. If you have an El Nino, within the same months, you can basically flood East Africa, burn Australia to a crisp, melt Arctic ice sheet, and grow new ice in Antarctica in the same months. This is how powerful worker circulation changes can be even today. Like if climate were a superhero, El Nino and La Nina would be its superpower because with a small change in temperature in the tropics, you can bring the entire Earth's climate system to its heel easily. So just kind of like going through what it does, this is what you can see right now is a normal worker circulation position. You have convection over Indonesia, you have some convection going on over the South American continent and a little bit going on in Africa. So La Nina is this system put on steroids. So everything is strengthened. Worker circulation being really, really strong is equivalent to La Nina conditions. The reason that is, is the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean are interconnected through these convection belts. So you're changing one, in this case, the Pacific, the biggest of the oceans, the other ones change too in a general concept. So the temperature difference in the Pacific is the strongest. It's five, six degrees difference. In the Indian Ocean, it's only two and in the Atlantic, it's about one. So the strongest pull on the system is really in the Pacific Ocean, which is the reason it's usually defined there. So this is basically La Nina is a really strengthened version of the worker circulation. And in contrast, the El Nino is then the weakened version of it. And just for you to understand what this does from a conceptual point of view, I'm gonna switch back and forth these two slides now a few times. So you can see that when the worker circulation changes from its strong to its weak format, it changes east-west along the equator, which is a huge difference to most atmospheric systems you might have heard of before. So if it's strong, everything shifts, in this case, to the right of the screen. If it's weak, everything shifts the other way. So back, forth, east, west, east, west. This is what it does. Walker circulation in a climatic time, uh, in a climatic pattern translates into distinct changes east to west. So if you look into Africa now, just to get an idea of this, this is what it looks like on the continent today. This is a hundred year uh, observation data compared to El Nino pattern. And what you can see is blue colors are wet and reddish colors are dry that under La Nina conditions, you have a favorism to the west side of the continent and on El Nino condition to the east. So this is a just, you can basically almost draw a line through the continent, the way it reacts, which is distinctively different from this, which is usually what you see when you see or think about African climate, which is a monsoon belt, which shifts north-south, since it always shifts into the hemisphere that's warmest. So our summer, the monsoon belts are further on the north, in the northern hemisphere, whereas southern summer, it shifts on the other hemisphere. So this is a very distinct north-south shift, which is also what is proposed for glacial interglacial change. And basically the difference between what I just told you, what the walker circulation can do and what normal ch climatic change can do. So with this concepts put together, now let's get into the study because we try to look on how this change could translate into the past. The first thing is, if you want to look at how the climate change do anything to humans, what you need. So one of the main issues with polyclimate studies is it's usually one site, 
very often, or maybe two, if you get really lucky, it's three. So you have maybe one or two sites, and then an entire continent, an entire globe is inferred based on this data. So when I started my, uh, my work in Potsdam, I, I kind of like thought, how can we do this differently? How can we look at the continent as a whole, rather than looking at one single record? So, so first we started off on the continent. If you look at climatic archives, on the continent that can detail you wet dry changes because that's what we're interested in you're basically down to four so there's one in the west Buzumfi, Lake Buzumfi, which is about 500,000 years then we have Lake Malawi and Magali which about a million years in length and then the tuba here record in Ethiopia which is about 600,000 years that's it so you can't do a million years with the data at hand you can roughly do 600,000 give it a take first off secondly this is not enough. That's three data points in the east and one in the west. You can't do much of anything with that. So this is where the ocean view comes into the title and into the project. Because since I'm a paleoceanographer, I kind of looked around the continent and was trying, like, how can we use what's there out there in the ocean to look into the continent, which gets us to this. These are marine records that surround the African continent that we used. Like in case of the Mediterranean core, this is actually something that records the Nile discharge. Since the Nile is sourced in Africa, we can use its variability to look into the continent. Then the Sahara or the core before Libya are, for instance, dust records that detail to some extent what's going on in these regions. We have Congo River outflow, Limpopo River outflow. These are just marine records telling you something about to some extent, the rim regions of the African regions that they lie before. That's why you have this bigger circle as a projection of what they tell us on the continent. So this gives us 11 records. 11 records that have something to do with wet and dry, that have an age model that is kind of OK. And now the question is if they have a common driving mechanism, because one way or the other, they should. Whether or not it's glacial interglacial change or water circulation doesn't matter. It should be in all of them one way or the other. So how to derive this signal? We basically use the records and shove them into a principal component analysis or a PCA. What a PCA does, it looks at all the data and then it extracts the one signal that is so dominantly that it's represented in everything. So it's kind of like, Restrict, uh, extract the one thing all of them have in common. So this common signal explains the most variance, so the most variability in this record, and is the most dominant signal. And it looks like this. So a lot of wiggle work going on over the last roughly 600,000 years. OK, interesting. If you have a little bit of work with paleoclimatology, one of the really interesting aspects that you can find is that this kind of looks like an insulation pattern. If you plot eccentricity, so the oval eccentricity, whether or not the orbit of Earth is either a circle or an ellipsoid, you can see that the pattern you see extracted from Africa kind of looks in the long-term pattern the way we find it. So that infers that insulation might have been very important to the signal. What is also what is really one of the neat things about the PCA, it not just gives you a signal out, it also tells you how every site you put into the PCA relates to the others. So we can directly infer a geographical pattern. And what it does or what it showed us when we made the analysis is that this record or this analysis splits the records from the east directly against the records from the west. So this PCA translates with the positive values into all the East African sites getting wet. And when it becomes negative, all of West Africa is getting wet. So East and West Africa are never wet at the same time. So they're in opposing patterns. To kind of like try to visualize this a little bit better for you, let's zoom into phase two and three here in the middle just for you to get a more visual idea of what I mean. So just looking at these two phases, phase two means that all of the sides on the West side signal wet and i can't tell you what wet wet means in this case this is a relative change but they're all getting wet for their location whereas the east is all getting dry and then you shift from phase two to phase three so going from the old to the young you shift directly the other way around 
So within a few thousand years, you're shifting the moisture center on the continent from one side to the other. So this is basically what this tells you. As said before, this is not what an east uh, and north-south shift would do. This is not what glacial interglacial change would do because glacial interchange would do what it does today over the seasons. But if you compare this to the La Nina El Nino stuff I showed you, you can see that it's fairly similar. So what I reconstructed from the paleo data is what I can basically reconstruct today from observational data. Depending on the phase of you have a La Nina or El Nino, you have either one side wet or the other. If you now want to translate this into, or basically kind of like, how can you prove this in a way? What you can do is you can take that PCA signal and then kind of reconstruct El Nino variability over time. Since the most important region to change in the Walker circulation is the Pacific, and we have SST records from the Pacific available over millions of years, really, we can look into this ocean, into the surface ocean temperature change that relate to water circulation changes and can reconstruct its variability over time. So, and if I were right about the emphasis I just made that if West Africa, you should have La Nina and if East Africa is getting ready, you should have El Nino, then this should translate into the appropriate temperature changes also in the, in the Pacific. Meaning if you have a very strong um, walker circulation, then, hang on, West Pacific should be much more warmer than the East Pacific. And that should kind of like the, the temperature gap should close during El Nino conditions. So if you do this, this is the temperature signal. And as you can see, it works. Oops, sorry, it works. So when, it, when the temperature gradient is getting smaller, you have more El Nino conditions, which is then what you can see with wetter East Africa and vice versa. So for the last, let's say 400,000 years, the signal pattern match is fairly good, despite the age model uncertainties that I have. And you can kind of like see it if you look into the last bit of the figure around, let's say 450 to 600,000 years. The offset there is probably a matter of age model issues because the marine records used for the El Nino proxy are on Delta 18O, like stable oxygen isotopes particularly. So it's really good. But the record I created, particularly also from terrestrial records, these age models are usually pretty bad the older they get. So this might could be a real signal, but I would think it's more like an age model issue because of all the terrestrial stuff I included in the analysis. The main message here is that the pattern I extracted from the continent is not as random as it looks like. So it relates to insulation and it does exactly what I would expect it to do based on modern observation data, which kind of like gets us to this, what you just saw. This is phase two to four. So from 500,000 to zero with the main changes around 300,000 years and then the other major changes around 120,000 years. These are the three main phases. This is one eccentricity cycle. And the reason I want to show you that is now by going through, because if this climatic change occurred the way we think, it should be also visible in other archives in a way. So the first thing it should be visible in is vegetation, because vegetation is supposed to linear respond to climatic change. These are vegetational data, but represented as a degree of openness. The reason for that is simple. Grass is not, it can be wet in one location and can be an indicator for dry in the other location. So taking or picking out one certain vegetation species is not going to tell you anything. This is depending on whatever vegetation it is at that location, a measure of whether or not it's getting closer as in vegetation cover or more open. And what you can see is going from old to young, so from the left to the right of the screen, is when it is wet in West Africa, you have a more closer vegetation there. And then when you shift into the El Nino position in the middle panel, you have a wetter East Africa, in this case, 
West Africa is getting more open and East Africa is getting close on vegetation. So you see the same facing in the vegetation in response to the climatic change we are proposing. It's basically response by being either dense, more, more dense and more closed or more open. What's also really interesting is, is if you translate this vegetation change now into animals, particularly mammals. Not, there's not that much known about uh, mammals because, well, you need fossils for that too. But what we know is that there is a distinct east-west pattern in mammals too in Africa. So meaning that two examples here are heartbeats and the African buffalo. That, the northwestern populations are often very different from the east and to some extent from the south and the south is sometimes very close to the west. The interesting stuff about mammals is the subdivision faces fit exactly within the age model uncertainties to the faces we propose. So the east-west split is very often related to around 300,000 years and then again to roughly 150,000 years. So the same phases we see in the climate, we see in the vegetation, and we see in animals. Since humans, our ancestors, occupied a similar ecological niche, they must have experienced a similar change. How they reacted to that is a different matter. But this is the ecological change they must have endeavored during these time periods, because it's represented in all the other aspects of environmental change. So if you keep that in mind and look a little bit beyond just the 600,000 years that I just showed you, if you take that paleoanthro proxy I showed you and just extend it to a million years, what's interesting is the change around 300,000 years is seemingly the most dramatic change in African climate history. It's not just a random change that occurred at that point. It's the most profound change of that entire time frame. if you look at the last million years. Because you come from a long-term phase of La Nina conditions favoring West Africa, switching it fairly permanently to the other side of the, of the continent. This is a dramatic change. So if any climatic transition could have pulled any stronghold on our ancestors, it, that climate transition and not a million years before or another million years after. It's pretty much what this record can kind of like give you a glimpse into. And we know from analysis from our human lineages that 300,000 years is actually one of the most profound changes from our archaic um, ancestors to us as a species, as Homo sapiens. So, and I also want to drive the point home for the basically for kind of like coming to the end of the talk is why is this more important than maybe CO2 changes or glacial interglacial? This is from the Antarctic ice core, CO2 in the middle red. Um, it's a temperature blue on the, uh, on the top and then it's methane green on the bottom. This is a record as it stands for the last 800,000 years. And the most profound change in that record is the Midbrunus event around 450,000 years. So it's much older than the change around 300,000 years that we saw in the other records. So while there is a lot of change going on, at 300,000 years, there's not that much going on out of the ordinary. You change from an interglacial to a glacial. That, that's all that's going on at the time, but nothing really profound that jumps into your eye. And that's the same thing also for the ice volume record. So this is again, Bentic Delta 18.0 record that I showed you early on with warm periods up and cold periods down for the last million years. And the most profound change is here around the mid-Pleistocene transition when you change the way glacial interglacial change was driven from obliquity to eccentricity. At 300,000 years, there's nothing really dramatic going on that is out of the ordinary of the changes that have occurred before. So if you have to, if you really need a framework, you can put archeological records onto, it could make more sense to look at water circulation changes rather than at anything else. That's not to say the other stuff like glacial interglacial change or CO2 didn't have an impact. They surely did, but probably not on the long-term timescale that were seemingly um, operated mostly by water circulation changes. 
So just to sum this up and kind of come to the end of, of, of my talk, the point we're really trying to drive home with this is that worker circulation changes might have been the more important mechanism than let's say glacial interglacial change or even CO2. It doesn't mean that didn't have an influence, but it means that at least on the long periods of time, worker circulation change might have been more important. However, I also like to say that worker circulation, the way we understand it today, isn't that old. It's about 2 million years. So how this worked when you go back in time, we don't know yet. And we also don't know how this translates into really small um, time frames. let's say the last 20,000 years, does this still hold up or not? So there are a lot of open questions on translating this pattern on different time scales. The other thing is that the phases we find in worker circulation changes during the last 600,000 years, which is the time frame of our occurrence, our species occurrence in Africa, is imprinted strongly in vegetation and mammals. And if it's in them, it should have somehow impacted humans as well. How exactly? Whether or not they moved, they died, they adapted, they found new innovative way to deal with this. That's a completely different matter. And based on the archaeological record, we might never know actually. But something must have given because this is how the environment changed and they didn't have the abilities we have today to pretty much terraform Earth to our every whim. So something must have happened to them in, in a way that they had to kind of like adapt to these circumstances. Um, that this idea, this change from glacial interglacial change more important than anything else to worker circulation is not just something that's basically driven our work and that we are trying to translate into the community, but just a few weeks after we published, this nature paper came out, building on the work we did that also heavily drives home this point on time scales that longer than what we looked at. So they looked for a couple of million years, I think six, look at how this worked. So there's a consistent stream of papers now coming out that really hammering down the point that we need to move away from the idea that you need huge ice sheets to change tropical climate towards you look for climatic processes within the tropic first, and then you look to the really big high latitudes for any change to explain whatever it is you see in your records. So I really hope I could kind of like translate all of this fairly complicated stuff to you in a way that was understandable. And I appreciate a lot um, your attention. And again, thank you very much for inviting me. And if you have questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tiffany. It was really enlightening for us. After all, we're not so far from Africa, geographically speaking. And um, I opened the podium for the audience to ask questions. They had questions. Um, hi, Stefania. Thanks for the talk. I have a question. Yes, in the in the map showing the variations of the wet and dry conditions um, in East and West Africa, I don't know. Maybe you could go back to it. Okay. Um, you just tell me when when to stop. Yeah, when to stop. Um, yeah. This uh, this yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I see like there's a difference in um like there's a variation in the eastern part yes compared to in both of the maths the phase two and phase three maps could you maybe explain sure the, um, um this basically this boils down to one data point specifically lake yeah. malawi lake mm -hmm. malawi is difficult difficult for lots of reasons there are a bunch of different age models out there that kind of like not really make a huge difference but have some and Lake Malawi is also just a weird location in a way. We know from today that it basically is located at the pretty much at the limit where El Nino and La Nina interact depending on which mode you're in. So there is a fair chance that Malawi reacted one way or the other because it's just an imprint of small regional differences that are really hard to kind of like look into on, on the time scales we're working on. So it's really hard to say why Malawi is doing something different when the rest on eastern sides are very much in sync. 
and it does change towards the last. Why it is different in between, I can't really tell you. I can only tell you it does this. Yeah, could that be explained by factors outside uh, paleoclimate? Yes. Yes, it could be an issue of the proxy it's, record. It could yeah. be an issue of and the other mechanisms. Maybe this site is very sensitive to uh, frontal shifts for whatever reason, because it's closely located to the Mozambique Strait. There are a million reasons why this specific site is not doing what it's supposed to do some of the time. But more research would actually be needed to nail this down why it's weird. Yeah, that's a research project. <laughs> yeah, pretty okay, much. Thanks. You're most welcome. Somebody else has questions? Beverly? <laughs> I always have questions. Hi, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, a really a great presentation and, and nice to kind of um, the big providing us with the big picture and, and coming into to some more details. Um, now, I guess my question with with uh, when you were talking about the paradigm, you know, the paradigm shifts, you know, this this focus of wanting to anchor everything to, you know, the glacial changes, and and um, I think that you know it is very interesting how science so often has a geographical problem, you know, where we 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 like to have these simple explanations, of course, in the end, everything kind of relating uh, to each other. Um, I guess my question here is you, you're, you talk about a lot of really big data sets have or potential data sets like, you know, the, the animal record and um, being able to, you know, look at the isotope value, perhaps from you know, grazing animals and seeing the changes in the in the humidity, um, you know, changes in rainfall, changes in humidity attached to this. Has Is that work being done and are, are, are you seeing some overlap to better? understand what these areas would be for for humans i guess let me let me get more targeted on my question the hominid record has relatively few samples right i mean you know it's not a big data set are those and maybe you don't have the answer to this but are those hominid fossil collections how much work is being done on the other bone material and things around it to kind of get a better sense of the broader environmental situation, at least from, from this, you know, humid, dry, uh, isotopic kind of level. Okay, okay, L let, let's see if I can just um, like, <laughs> um, pull the different strings out of it. So the, the first question is uh, uh, regarding the animals. Um, the thing about a lot of the studies basically boils down to lineage changes based on fossils. So the, the pictures you saw are basically fossil distribution and lineage changes that they inferred from that and then mostly DNA changes that they did on the fossils. So these changes and divisions usually boil down to a lot of DNA going on. So change here to change there. And based on the DNA, they can also show when they split, which gets us these time frames that we link up to the climatic change. As for the human molecular clock uh, estimations. Yes, exactly. So this gets us to lineage north change from, let's say, east. And that gives us kind of like the similarities we see in the climate change and in the vegetation. So we infer, since it is, it's one ecosystem, you're changing the parameter driving it, you're changing the vegetation, you're changing this, then everything has to change with it, more or less. Um, to the other part as what's done with, with humans. I'm not an archaeologist, but from, from, the, from, from the gist I'm getting from the being at the rim of this oh, entire community, no, no. there is lots and lots of going on. They also look heavily now to the west of Africa because there's fairly nothing it's not like it's nothing done, but it hasn't been looked at it with the eyes of the 21st century, really. So new methods are applied. They're going back to the fossils. They're open, basically, in the museums, going back, trying to sort out what it is that we actually have. Because it's not so much an issue of there are not enough fossils. It's an issue of there are a lot of fossils, but they don't know what to do with it in a way of they can't really place it into anything. So I think a sharpening of the archaeological record can help with saying how this, if this works even, and if so, how it might have translated into adaptation or movement or whatever, um, it's much better solved for the last phase, like the last 120,000 years. 
this phase is much better resolved in the archaeological record, like out of Africa phases and stuff like that. So this bit, if you zoom in, works still pretty good with what we know, so which gives us a lot of confidence to also go back and further time. But one of the reasons we also limited this study to 600,000 years is at a million years, there's barely anything we can look into the archaeological records. There's nothing, like not much. It's really hard to infer anything from like one bone. So we really limit it. And the best we can do from a climatic point of view is provide a framework we think that works and actually does explain the variability we see rather than wishful thinking. So with this climatic framework, we can again make a hypothesis to say, okay, at that point in time, East Africa should have looked like this. And then the archaeological people can go and see if they can find any indication that this is actually how it looked like and that humans did anything with this. So it's more rather than we telling them this is how it is, us saying like, okay, this is what we've got, the best we can do. Maybe you can do something with that. So we're trying to go the other way around for a change. Okay, <clears throat> somebody else has a question? I have a question, I have yeah. some. <laughs> um, I personally always had some kind of a problem when to tackle an entire continent as, um, as a site to reconstruct climate. Nobody basically has done the same, you know, with uh, Europe, which is basically half the size of Africa, right? Or Asia. So I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm working also on similar stuff, but so I understand the point that comes out of tackling the entire continent. But I think that it drives into into misconception sometimes because it's a it's a whole continent, and um, you know I'm just watching the slide in front of my eyes, and there is a question mark in in several areas which are wide as several countries in Europe. So how how to solve that? Do you, you see my point? I completely agree. But the thing is, I completely agree that you that you have to find a more global like more over regional um, approach to these kind of, of, of questions the thing is that for instance with the nature paper i showed you at the end it's again one site it's again boils down to one record and then they go ahead and explain entire east africa with it it's a wonderful work but it goes back to the same issue so what we were trying is to find a way how to go a different way this is not perfect by far not and the the question mark in the middle boiled down to no records. It basically boils down to there's nothing to use because marine records concentrate well on the continental margins around, and the 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 um, the on land records usually locate lakes like Malawi, like Magadi, like Bosonfi. So if there is no big big lake that has been around for a million years, let's say in the middle of the Sahara, there won't be a record notwithstanding the issues of going there, drilling there, making climate record there. So in a lot of ways, for instance, Europe would be, I would say, an easier target to some extent, but even more complicated because Europe sits at the interface between high latitudes and low latitudes. So the climatic pattern there is much more complicated than Africa in a way. So whether or not this approach would work in, in Europe, I have no idea. It's completely possible you try this in Europe and it's just noise. So um, there are a lot of uncertainty goes in, but what gives me some confidence with, with this approach is one, that we can find it in other records in, independent from this climate stuff, one. So this is not just the faces we make up are not just seemingly random, but we can find other lines of evidence supporting us. And secondly, you need to keep in mind the first PCA that I worked with explained a third of the climate variability in all the records, a third, at least two third to other stuff, at least to noise in the records, to other patterns on the, on the continent that have an influence. The PCA is a wonderful tool just to get out what's most important. It doesn't exclude other important stuff. It just ranks it and says, this is more important than anything else. 
but there is enough variability in there that goes to other arguments and other uh, mechanisms. So in a way, and I'm not sure it's a misconception, but you have to be careful in the way that you do not exclude other stuff. It's all probably in there, it's a mixture, but a PCA might help you sorting it a certain way. That, that's basically what it does. Okay. We have another question from the audience. Um, Mo is asking in the chat, very interesting talk, he's saying. And he's asking if there is any human ancestors found from the Chuba Hill uh, Lake setting in Ethiopia. Within the Chuba Hill record, no. But if, ooh, but um, <coughs> hang on, I have to go because I can't remember all the names. I'm a, I'm a climate person, not an archaeologist. So um, which one is it? Omo Kibish. Omo Kibish is the one that isn't too far off from the location where it is. So the one that is usually inferred to is Omo Kibish and Hertos. These are the two that are referred to within the vicinity of it. And then also the Bodo one, which I think Asfa found, who is also one of the co-authors. So these are the ones that usually infer, but within Chuba here, to the best of my knowledge right now, they had didn't find anything directly there, at least not that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, I think uh, we need to, to close today. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to thank you again, Stephanie. Um, and I wanted to know if you would like to stay in touch with us and receive information about our future talks. Sure, I would love to. Perhaps you would like to join as well. So, uh, well, thank you very much, everybody. And, and thank you again. And I hope that we will be able to host you, Stephanie. And uh, see you next week. Sure. Bye. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you.